So, let's talk next about machine authentication. Now, machine authentication is in many ways a strict subset of attestation because authentication is all about identifying a machine and attestation is all about the state of a machine, but realistically saying some machine somewhere is in state X is not very useful. So, attestation practically actually means machine X is in state Y. And when we talk about authentication, all we really care about is are you machine X? So, most TPM keys, i.e. ones that are not migratable, uh, can be used for machine authentication because after all, the TPM is to the motherboard, the keys are cryptographically bound to the TPM, so if the key is used, it was used on that machine. This is why I said yesterday that machine authentication is the easiest of the TPM applications to roll out. You pretty much get a pipe call if you're using a TPM key. So, there's two basic types, signing and decryption. Signing-based machine authentication is what most people think of if they are told, how do I identify a machine? They think, well, have that machine sign some data, and we know the data came from that machine. Um, this is great if you want to establish that this data passed through that machine. I will note, this is not quite the same as origination, but you at least know it came from that machine, even if you don't know that that machine actually created it. Um, so, here, our focus is going to be on the non-attestation signatures. If you're doing an attestation, you really do just get authentication for free. <laughs> because after all, you know the state of this machine, maybe it came with some data attached, we're not going to, you've proved the machine. Here, we're going to talk about those scenarios where you don't want the extra overhead of state information. And keep in mind how fragile PCRs are, and how hard they are to interpret, that's actually pretty frequent especially in an enterprise context or in a consumer context where I want to know where this came from, I can't interpret the state of your machine, especially not today, let's ju just tell me who you are and I'll assume that you know, we've got regulations saying what software you want to run because we're a corporation, we've got a corporate image, that's good enough for me. So choosing the right key for authentication is unfortunately a little trickier than Ariel, one Ariel, quick question. Because we can't make it easy. So, on the previous slide yes. you were pointing out that, you know, machine X signed Y is not the same thing as uh, message origin authentication, for instance. Is there any decent way to get message origin authentication? Um, not using the TPM because the TPM has no insight into origination. Any TPM operation that takes user data says, I've been handed user data, I will perform the relevant operation on it, I don't know if that user data originated one level up or three machines over. The exception to that is TPM data itself, because the TPM makes some guarantees about how it will create it. So, I do have origination information on things like a certified key certificate, because the TPM will only issue that if it created it according to local data. But usually when people talk about, I want to know the origination point of data, they mean, I want to make sure that this calculation came from this machine, or I want to know where this picture was processed, and the TPM just doesn't have insight into that. The closest we can get to origination information um, from a TPM perspective, I am not an expert in data origination techniques and data tracking, is if I've got a set of PCR values that reflect trustworthy software, then I have some assurance that that software probably didn't go onto Google, pull a picture down from there, and say to the TPM, please sign it as though it came from... But if you have multiple machines right, which have the exact same configuration, then it doesn't seem like the uh, PCR state would, would imply any sort of origin authentication because different machines next to each other would have the same state. So I guess you were saying, go ahead, well, go ahead. Well, the, the, PCR, the PCR state there isn't being used to distinguish two machines. It's being used to say, good software will not lie. The TPM will sign whatever it is handed. And it doesn't know if that was generated locally or remotely. It, it came from a local request, but who was the software that said, please sign this, 
honest is, is the answer that we can only get by analyzing sure. PCRs. Yep. And then that since you sense? said, you know, the closest we can get is by using some uh, keying information that the TPM will only give you because it was key information that it itself generated. Is there any way to use that sort of information and mix it with user data basically to, you know, bind some user data to a particular key blob that, uh, or key certificate that the TPM will give you in order to make them associated? So it's easy to associate data with a machine using the TPM. The TPM just can't tell you what that... This, this is the, why I tend to say this came, or, yeah, this came from this machine. We don't know it originated in this machine. We know this machine had it. We know this machine signed it with the TPM. But because the TPM has no insight into where the data came from, you know, we, we, can, we can confirm that it was on this machine all we want. TPM's great at that. I just have talked to a bunch of people where when they say data origination, they really do mean who, you know, which person actually created that data on which machine. And all the TPM can tell you is this machine signed this data, it was present on this machine. Okay, that's fine. I was just trying to think if there were any ways to get around proxy attacks and things like that. So. Yeah, and if there are, I certainly haven't come up with any. And the, the big problem is that the TPM doesn't, the TPM is blind. Um, there are a lot of things we could do tremendously usefully if we have more channels to the TPM. You know, things like saying, I have a smart card that I want to plug in, and I want to make sure that that smart card authentication came from the same machine that this TPM authentication came from. If there were any way for the TPM and the smart card to talk without the software getting in between, we'd have a hugely powerful um, tool there. But the only way for them to talk right now is via software. And once you've said it's going via the, the, the drivers, you can't really guarantee that it was only the drivers and not the drivers in the network unless you were also doing very detailed state analysis. So, Usually when we see people who want those tools, we start saying, this is what PCR analysis is for, this is what state attestation is for, and yes, that's a very hard problem. I, I wish I had better answers for you. Okay, so let's see. Um, I think that wraps up the questions on yep. that. So let's talk about your choices in keys to use for signing data. So the obvious choice for I want to sign data is to create a TPM signing key. It's got this nice name that says, hey, use me for signing. Unfortunately, signing keys come in several varieties. And the properties you choose for your signing key can make or break the signing key as a useful piece of security. Um, the key length, of course, is the obvious one. You've got 512 bits up to 2048 bits. In general, if you're trying to use this for any kind of moderately secure application, use the most bits you can get. Um, migratability. If you're trying to use a key for machine authentication, you really, really want a non-migratable key. After all, if it's migratable, you don't actually know which machine it's on, so authenticating a machine with it is a pain in the neck, and you don't want to do this. It's not going to work. Um, there are certifiable migratable keys. Again, even though those are certifiable, you don't want to use them for machine authentication because saying this came from some set of trusted machines is usually not what you want with machine authentication. There may be some special use cases if you're doing, you know, server clusters, but realistically, when we're talking about machine authentication, most people mean I want to know exactly which machine I'm talking to. And for that purpose, you really want a non-migratable key, whether it's certified or not. The signature scheme is the big, what the heck is this, um, non-intuitive choice with signing keys that can make or break the key uh, security. There's three scheme options, SHA-1, DER, and something called INFO. Now, these are all, despite the phrase signature scheme, these are all RSA keys. This determines the data formats that these keys will sign. Um, yeah, this is the big one that, that's, that's really obnoxious. 
shell one keys will find 20 byte chunks of data, which is say, the length of shell one hash. Um, this can be user data or TPM data. But since there's no way to distinguish the user data from the TPM data, this means that you can use a SHA-1 key to trivially forge TPM data if you're willing to trust a SHA-1 key with TPM data in the first place. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. Forgery is trivial. You can't trust anything coming out of one of these keys because they will find any 20-byte hash you give them, and we can't tell if that 20-byte hash was generated by the TPM or generated by the user. Never, ever, ever trust a SHA-1 key with TPM data. Period. Hey Ariel, sorry. DR keys, so, so in the 2.0 spec, I mean, so you're pointing at a lot of places where, you know, it's kind of don't do that things. In the two, TPM 2.0 spec, would this be the sort of thing where you would recommend that they basically put in something that adds, you know, a bit into the final output signature, which indicates that the data came from the TPM or a user? Is that the kind of... Uh, what I would actually... What I would actually probably do for the 2.0 spec is say don't you don't allow SHA-1 keys to be used on TV, to sign TBM data. But um, I'll be perfectly honest, this is not a section of the 2.0 spec I've read, so I don't know what they did. Sorry. Um, I can look that up for you, but I don't have an answer as to what choice they made. I believe they are aware of this problem, so hopefully they did something about it. The problem with the TBM specs in general is the reason that they have certain decisions that scream, why did you do that, are there's two big um, motivations driving the committee. And the first big motivation is there's a bunch of people there who care deeply about security. And the second big motivation is there's a bunch of people there who care deeply about um, backwards compatibility and general I'm not even going to say ease of use, but giving people what they expect. And those two motivations are often contradictory. That said, I am pretty sure that they are aware of this problem, and I'll go check it out and let the committee know if they aren't. Um, adding a bit to the signature such that SHA-1 signatures over TPM data will always be 21 bytes, not 20 is certainly an, a reasonable option. I'd rather just go ahead and say don't sign TPM data with this kind of key because what do we get from allowing it, you know? Um, well, wouldn't the thing that you get from allowing it be, again, sort of something like being able to confirm that something originates from the TPM itself? Would that not be one possible thing? Um, so we want to be able to, to dis distinguishing TPM data from non-TPM data is very important, but why do you need to use the same key for both? New keys are cheap. Like, we've got three types of signing key here. One of these types was deliberately designed to be safe to sign TPM data with, although it turned out that it had a bug in it. Um, Given that there was a key type that was safe to sign TPM data with, why did they make one that was unsafe to sign TPM data with, you know? Now, I, I don't have the answer to that motivation question. But you could solve that by either making the unsafe one safe, or you could solve that by not allowing the unsafe one to sign the TPM data as long as you've got some technique for signing TPM data. Note also that identity keys sign TPM data. So even if you can't use a signing key for it, which is what I'm about to recommend, it's not as though we can't detect TPM data. We just use special keys to do it. And that doesn't seem to be very much of a problem to me. If you can find a use case where we need to use the same key for both the user data and TPM data but want them to be distinguishable, which we pretty much always do, I would actually love to hear it because I haven't come up with any. So um, feel free to jump in if I, if I haven't addressed anything here, but I, I figure I might yeah, as well continue. Sense, I think. Um, so I think your key point is that it is all about just whether or not a single key can be used for two different types, and yeah, I can't really think of any use case where I explicitly want that as well. Exactly. So 
Um, Shaolin keys, we are going to be using a bunch of, probably, but as I say, use them for user data, not for TBM data. The DER keys, sign DER formatted data, which is a particular data formatting scheme, and I'll be honest, please don't challenge me too much on that because I went and looked at the Wikipedia page and that's all I know. Um, the, so these keys will only sign user data. This is what, basically what I was just saying is we have keys that, that are only used for user data. I think SHA-1 keys ought to be treated as that too. Um, you should probably check and make sure you don't think they're signing TPM data, but realistically they're never going to, so they are safe as long as you make sure you are treating them as what they are. Um, info keys are a special TCG key format, and what they do is that they sign data in a wrapper that says basically, this is TPM signed data. Um, these are designed to be just like identity keys, but they also sign this, this, this wrapped user data. Um, okay, great. Uh, and the problem with these is that, that historically these were actually very recommended by certain people on the TCG so that rather than having an identity key and a separate signing key, you just use an info signing key and you can use this one key for all of your signing needs. And the problem is it turns out that wrapped data format includes a, quote, local nonce, which is provided by the software layer, not generated by the TPM, but doesn't actually serve any kind of freshness purpose. It's just part of the transaction. Um, unfortunately, due to the way that nonce works, which is to say you can provide it with arbitrary data, but it's being used in a set format, um, this is apparently vulnerable to a SHA-1 collision attack. And the only TPM operation that is apparently vulnerable to this particular SHA-1 collision attack. Um, there's a paper you can find online by Stan Potter um, that talks about uh, that basically when this attack was discovered, he went through and he analyzed all of the TPM commands and formats. And this is the only vulnerability he found. Info keys we now recommend not using for anything because the only thing that was different between an info key and an identity key was that you could use this special TPM signed data format that is completely unsafe. So don't do that, especially because frankly when you're dealing with SHA-1 collision attacks, it's probably wise to not use the key at all. So um, the way you can use signing keys for machine authentication is to sign things. I'm sure you're all very shocked. Um, this will let you sign arbitrary user provided data as long as it's in the appropriate format for the key. So don't try signing large data formats with your SHA-1 key unless you actually hash it first. Um, so the nice thing about these is that they can often be dropped into an existing protocol. If you have a protocol that calls for a signature and that signature is allowed to be you know, a signature over SHA-1 hash or a signature over something DER format, all you have to do is trade your software key for a TPM key, and all of a sudden you've got machine authentication for free. This is actually pretty darn cool. Um, as long as you're willing to accept the fact that the TPM is not speedy. So if you're doing this once, and once every few minutes, this is totally not a problem. If you're trying to do this once every few microseconds, you're dead in the water. Don't try using this for high frequency operations. Do not try signing packets with your TPM. Um, it's just not going to work very well. So this will let you associate any data with the machine. And you know, it's not going to tell you where it came from originally, but it certainly tells you that this machine had control over that data and signed that data when that happened. Um, identity keys can also be used for machine authentication. See previous note about um, attestation for quotes. The, these are actually what they're intended for, is not just machine authentication, but TPM authentication, which, since they're soldered together, is often the same thing. Um, identity keys are the only key that we recommend using for TPM data. And this includes quotes, but it also includes things that are not explicitly attestation-based, like certified key certificates, the TPM has audit logs of various operations, quote uh, tick counters, um, any kind of thing signed by the TPM about the TPM's internal state, always use an identity key. But conveniently, these all also imply machine authentication. So when you get a tick stamp 
uh, signature from the TVM that tells you which machine the counter came from. Um, so if you are only signing user data, we, you actually can do this with a quote by the simple expedient of extending user data into a PCR and doing a quote of only that PCR and ignoring everything else. This is awfully high overhead, given that you've got to include a nonce and so forth, but you can do it. Um, but really where identity keys shine is at a station and the TPM specific data formats. The other thing about identity keys, though, is you cannot misconfigure an identity key. Um, when you're dealing with signing keys, you can create one that's migratable. That means that if I'm using a signing key and for authentication, I need to check the signature to make sure, or check the certificates to make sure it's not migratable. I need to check the certificate to make sure that it is, in fact, a SHA-1 key, and given that it's a SHA-1 key, that it's not signing TPM data. There is nothing I can do with an identity key to make it untrustworthy. That's the whole point. They are always created non-migratable, maximum key length. There aren't, aren't any options you can mess up, and they are only ever used for the TPM data. So, in general, identity keys are most powerful largely because they let you get away with assuming things that signing keys do not when it comes to just plain uh, authentication. So this is starting to get into the point I was making last slide. Verification matters. It's one thing to say we trust something, but what do we trust it for? Um, whenever you're looking at a TPM signature, you need to check and say, is this data supposedly claiming something about TBM state or keys or other kind of secure TBM held information? If so, is this actually a key I ought to believe when it's making claims about TBM state? I should never trust a signing key to make claims about the TBM. I should never trust a signing key that is migratable to make claims about machine authentication. Um, and I will note, this is also the same question we ask when talking about an attestation target. I've got a set of PCRs. I want to evaluate the set of PCRs. A set of PCRs that is a good state for a desktop within my corporation is still not a good state I should trust for a cloud machine. So always look at what your goals are when evaluating, is this the right key? Is this the, the data I ought to, to, to believe about this key? And so forth. So, um, we're almost done here, and then we can take a break. Um, decryption. This is a less intuitive form of machine authentication, but it's still pretty powerful. In this case, we are showing that we, uh, what our identity is by demonstrating that we possess a secret. In other words, the decryption key. So, a remote party can prove my identity by creating an encrypted challenge and sending it across the wire. If that challenge is decrypted, they know it was decrypted by me. Um, this is what binding keys, keys are for, because I can encrypt something remotely for a TPM key on your machine. This is also what the endorsement key is for. This is exactly what the AIK protocol takes advantage of. I'm not going to tell you um, in any detail about how to use your endorsement key for machine authentication with decryption, but you can actually do it if you're willing to do crazy tricks with that AIK protocol. Because remember how I said it's not technically signing the certificate, or it's not technically encrypting the certificate, it's encrypting a symmetric key? Right. That means that you can actually, if you're willing to play games with it, change what's in that wrapper. Mm -hmm. you're, the TPM's perspective, it still says this AIK is local and this endorsement key is local, so I'll decrypt your symmetric key. If what's in that, what that symmetric key encrypts is something other than a certificate, the TPM has no way of knowing. So you can, in fact, use activate identity as decryption-based machine authentication. We just generally don't recommend it. Please talk about complexity. Use a binding key. It's much simpler. <laughs> um, TPM storage keys, which we'll get to in a little while, I will note, are only for local data. You cannot encrypt something with a storage key remotely. So, um, the simplest form of decryption-based authentication is to take some target data, bind it with a binding key. This creates a, a, a little bundle. Um, 
you will see me talk about TPM unbind as an operation. There is no equivalent TPM bind because you're just encrypting with public key. It doesn't need to be in the TPM at all. You are not assumed to have the TPM or have access to the key itself. Um, TPM bind is actually a software operation, so it's not a TPM command. Um, in general, see previous note about uh, the slowness of encryption with uh, private keys. This means that usually what we actually see is if you're sending large quantities of data, you know, if I want to send a software update and know that only my sensor or my satellite, this actually came up, somebody wanted to, you know, TPMs on satellites, what an interesting idea. I want to update only that machine. I've got a couple of gigabytes of data. What I actually do is I encrypt it with a symmetric key and then bind the symmetric key to the TPM. Um, you can use this for attestation if that binding key has PCR values attached. The binding data structure does not actually let you specify the PCR values, but you will sometimes see contradictory information about that because everybody misremembers that, myself included. I looked it up yesterday. Um, many protocols use decryption by including a secret as part of the protocol. And this secret is not always something like a key. Sometimes it's just, I generated a random nonce, I encrypt the random nonce to the target, and anybody who returns a quote with that nonce in it, I know that that nonce went through the target machine. So the, the secret doesn't have to be long term. It could even be a session identifier as long as the session identifier is not predictable. Um, you can use this very powerfully by using a TPM key to establish a shared session key. Now I've got a channel that I know that the other end of the target is the TPM that I, is the machine with the TPM that I encrypted the session key to. Um, so the simplest possible authentication protocol, or better yet, mutual authentication protocol, is to create, you know, establish a session key via sending things uh, with, with bound bundles. Um, and as I, as I said just there, authentication just means identifying the machine. Usually in the real world, we rarely want one-way authentication. Every so often you do, I want to know which server I'm talking to, but the server will talk to any client. But often, in, especially in enterprise environments, when we are trying to do high security operations, you do want mutual authentication. We want to know what both ends of the channel are. So. That's what this little example is going to be about. So here, we can take some session key K1 that um, uh, A has just generated, um, and the name of A. Why do we include the name? Because I am a protocol designer, and I firmly believe that, that both parties agreeing on who each other are is a very important feature. Um, and sends that across to, to, to party B. Party B replies by binding together a little bundle that has their contribution to the shared session key um, and the names of both parties. Now they both know we're talking, you know, A and B are talking, we both agree that A and B are talking, and now we can create a symmetric key that is the combination of K1 and K2, and we can use that to chat away at our heart's content at high speed, because this is a symmetric key, knowing perfectly well that this channel was established via TPM approved authentication. So machine authentication is all about proof of machine identity. We can do that in multiple ways, signing or decryption. Um, if we're doing signing, you want to use a SHA-1 or DER key. Um, if you're doing TPM data, you want to use an identity key. Or really, in any case where you have high security application, you want to make sure you don't mess up somewhere in your key creation process or your verification process, it's generally a good idea to use an identity key. And binding keys are tremendously powerful if you're using decryption to guarantee the identity of a data recipient. So we talked about PCR's locality. We talked about attestation. And we've now talked about machine authentication. So that's one big fire hose here. Does anyone have any questions? Welcome back on slide 36. Uh, your last bullet was that uh, for the bind operation, it can also perform attestation by binding to PCR values. Then you were you were uh, yes. caveating that by saying that it can't actually be bound to PCR values. Is that bullet point accurate still? It, it, it can be bound to PCR values by bind by PCR constraining the binding key. 
Um, it can't be bound to PCR values by binding the bundle to a PCR, to, to a set of PCRs. Um, there's two different encryption operations which we're going to get to in the next talk, which is say bind and seal. People get them confused all the time, including TBM experts. And seal will let you do PCR constraints, bind will not. Yep, gotcha. Um, now, you will often see people talking about using disposable binding keys for this purpose. And I can, in fact, create a migratable binding key and ship that binding key across to a remote TPM with a storage key, and that binding key can be PCR constrained. So there are ways to do this that do not necessarily involve, hey, remote machine, create a binding key and send me the public half. It's just that there are a couple of hoops to jump through. Which hoops you prefer to jump through is really a matter of taste. Um, it is not insecure to use a migratable binding key if you're the one who generated it and you're the one who migrates it and you're only trusting it for this one transaction. Yes, you don't know where it goes next, but you don't care. You know where you sent it. So um, this is one of the few cases where you can do migration as part of authentication um, because yes, you're the one who controls the migration, so you know where it's going. Um, you do migrate two storage keys. So in some ways, you, you, one approach to decryption-based machine authentications I hadn't really considered because it's really a special purpose of, you know, operation is I have a migratable TPM key and I encrypt that migratable TPM key, that's what the migration operation is, to your storage key that's non-migratable. I at least know that you got it if that key is used. And as I said, migratable keys can't have PCR bindings.